calibration concepts and options today. And we're going to go in depth into calibration, all about what calibration is, uh, how to best, uh, may, may, maybe really a really re review on tool and user frame settings, how to best set your tool and user frames for IR vision calibration. The various calibration types, orthogonal and perspective uh, Im implementations of IR vision calibration. And then the implementation of calibration for your IR vision application. Manual calibration, automated grid frame setting, robot generated grid calibration, and some hints and tricks as we go along the way. So let's get started. First of all, I'd like to talk about calibration basics. I think if you have an understanding of why we do calibration and what you do to calibrate a system, uh, you will uh, better understand the process that we go through when we use these different calibration tools. At its most basic, calibration simply maps pixel coordinates to world coordinates. As you can see in our uh, slide here, this usually happens uh, with a grid structure of some sort, and a grid really only needs to have dots, targets, or anything else that can relate real-world coordinates to the camera pixel coordinates. In our grid, for example, we have uh, quite a few dots, but I just look at the first four dots. The real coordinates for that grid, un, uh, not, in, not in world space, but just the grid itself, if we start at the upper right hand, left hand corner, our 0, 0, 10, 0, 20, 0, 30, 0, for example, uh, perhaps in millimeters meters. When we look at that grid with the camera, the camera will return pixel values for those. And it's the relationship between the pixel values and the real world coordinates for that grid that make up a calibration for the, uh, for the camera. One further uh, note here, when we calibrate to the robot, then those numbers that we see for the uh, coordinates are uh, related to real world space after we've touched up the grid. The calibration process corrects for all image distortions. These would include planar distortions, uh, where the camera is not perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the grid, uh, perspective distortions, where perhaps the lens has created uh, a bit of a fisheye perspective, and as most lens do, and many other uh, geometric distortions that happen as we do normal imaging. So that's calibration in a nutshell. We use a special grid here at FAN. Uh, and we have a variety of these grids available. A specific grid pattern has to be used, and the grid pattern is, a, as you can see, a pattern of dots, uh, but with a special feature in the middle that are larger dots uh, with the uh, three dots extending in the X plus X direction and the two dots extending the plus Y direction. Now you can get this grid from FANUC. You can also fabricate or print or have it uh, custom made for you in a variety of sizes. It doesn't, the size doesn't matter, but there are some specifications that you'll find in the, in the IR Vision Operator Manual for the way and those dots must be placed in the relationship of the dots and their sizes. Uh, knowing that, however, you can fabricate and print your own calibration grid. When you select a grid for any calibration process, it would be nice if the grid covers as much of the field of view as possible, or let's say at least as much of the field of view that's going to be used in your image for guidance or for uh, location or for uh, inspection. The reason for this is that areas of the image not covered are not directly calibrated, and then therefore the results uh, of location uh, of features in those areas is extrapolated, and we would even call it indeterminate. We're not sure of the, because we haven't directly calibrated those areas, we're not sure of the actual uh, accuracy of the extrapolation of the calibration in areas where the dots don't appear for the calibration. If you only have, if you only can, calibrate the center of the field of view, hey, that's okay. But remember that uh, remaining parts of the field of view will simply be extrapolated. Grids are not required for robot-generated grid cal. This is a really exciting automated calibration process that I think many of you probably haven't tried. I want to encourage you to do that, and we're going to talk about that in detail uh, towards the end of our presentation today. So that's calibration in a nutshell. Uh, let's consider all of the options that we have for calibration and design of the calibration function within your application. Uh, and the reason I want to go through this is that I'd, I'd like uh, you to 
uh, embrace the idea that there are more than one uh, uh, option for designing your calibration structure in your IR Vision application. And it applies to a wide variety of uh, camera and robot combinations. For example, with a fixed camera, we can do what most people are most familiar with, that's a static grid calibration, uh, where the grid is defined via manual frame definition. We'll go over these in, in detail in just a moment. We also have a pops, uh, the option where you could uh, calibrate the fixed camera with a robot-held calibration grid. With that option, we can either use a manual frame definition like we did before, uh, very simple to touch up a a tool frame with a robot held object or we can do an automated uh, calibration process with a robot held grid again we'll talk about that and then third as I suggested we have a process called robot generated grid calibration which is an almost fully automated process to perform a calibration with a fixed camera let's think about if we have a robot mounted camera uh, a couple of options using a static grid. One is, again, going back to a manual frame definition. The other is to use uh, another automated process called automated grid frame set, which we'll uh, talk about again in just a moment. And just to expand on this idea, we have calibration design options for your application that would apply to the use of multiple robots where one robot has a camera, the other robot perhaps uh, uses a grid to calibrate that camera. We might, these things might happen due to um, reach issues or in, in certain situations we want the robots, uh, we want the camera calibrated for a robot that it's not even connected to. One key to this uh, function, and it's, it's quite easy to do with IR Vision, one key to the function, however, is that both robots must share a common application frame. Now, this is kind of an advanced function. We're not going to go into it in any detail here today. I want you to be aware, however, that it's available to you, and uh, should you have this type of an application, uh, please uh, consider it, and if you need help, of course, you can always get with us here at FANUC. Moving on, we can't really talk about calibration unless we clearly discuss, and for many of you this will be a re review, tool frames and user frames. So let's get into that, and um, if you're not too familiar with these, I hope you look into the uh, operator manuals uh, to find out uh, the, the best ways to teach user frames, to teach tool frames, but what is a frame? Fundamentally, it's a set of three planes at right angles to each other, and the point where those three planes intersect is the origin of that frame, as we can see in the upper uh, right-hand picture here. Frames are used for all of our applications, IR vision or not, to describe the location and orientation of a position. The location is the distance in X, Y, and Z directions from the origin of the reference plane. Ref excuse me, reference frame. Notice that that reference frame can be anywhere in, in, the, uh, in the world of the robot, and it can be at any angle, any orientation, any direction, um, and it's all related through transformations back to the robot world frame. Now, the world frame is a special case frame that always on all of our robots occurs at the center of J1 uh, and the center, or the intersection between the center of J1 and the center of J2. Um, and uh, of course, using the right hand rule, uh, po positive X is uh, towards, the, uh, towards the front of the robot, positive Y is towards the left of the robot as you uh, picture the robot arm. User frames are any of these other frames that are defined by us as users, either through a, a touch-up process by touching, uh, uh, following a procedure to touch uh, positions in the world, uh, the robot world, or by uh, discrete uh, data entry if we know the exact orientations of that user frame. A tool frame is a special case. A tool frame is a, also called a tool center point. It describes a position in a frame. A tool center point is always made relative to J6, the center of J6. And when you move a robot in a tool frame, that uh, point relative to the robot is the point at which the uh, position of the robot will be reported. There is a default tool frame, and that's the center of J6. Also, if you enter your own tool frame and make it 000, you will be referencing the center of J6.
all robotic app applications require the use of a valid and accurate frame in TCP. And here's where we get into trouble sometimes in calibration. First of all, a TCP or U-Tool must be accurately taught uh, in order to touch up a user frame. Usually we use a pointer like we see here in the video. Uh, we use a, particular, there's a, a specific set of processes in which you can touch that pointer and uh, aim it at a, a static point, as, we're, as we see here, to, uh, to train that uh, tool center pointer, that U tool. You also can do it again, as I said, by discrete entry. Creating a U tool is easy, and I'll just direct you to the documentation in the various manuals to learn how to teach a U tool if you don't know how. But I want to show you in this video how we check a U tool. We move the tool to a known pointer and then in tool coordinate jog, move that tool in uh, yaw pitch and roll as you see here, and the tool shouldn't move from the center of the targeted pointer as you move it around that pointer. This is key, and I would emphasize that we need a great deal of accuracy in touching up a calibration grid as a user frame we need a great deal of accuracy on our U-Tool to ensure that we're getting correct points in the world as we touch up the user calibration grid, or the calibration grid as a user frame. So let's look at that process briefly as a review. We have uh, two ways to touch up a calibration grid as a U-frame, and this, these just really follow how you would touch up any user frame. In the case of a calibration grid, however, there are very specific points we have to follow. We can use a three, uh, uh, three-point uh, uh, process where the orient origin point is the center of the large circles and the X and Y direction points are the furthest extent of the points on the grid. We also have as an option a four-point teach and you're seeing in the video uh, an example of a four-point teach where the first point we teach is the orient 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 origin point that's at the uh, lowermost corner relative to the X and Y positive directions and we have the X and Y direction points, which at, are at the furthest most extents of the grid, at least uh, uh, the furthest most points of the extent of the grid in the X and Y positive directions. And then the system or origin point, which is the center of the largest circle. You can see as you're kind of watching the video and I'm talking that I'm moving in this uh, example, moving the robot to the individual points and very carefully uh, adjusting the position of the, of the uh, TCP, uh, the pointer tool that, I, that has been taught, very carefully adjusting the position of that pointer to the very center of the dot on the calibration grid. During this process, that calibration grid can't move. And we often and always advise that your application have a fixtured calibration grid in the field of view of the camera that you can uh, move to when necessary, or maybe it's a replaceable grid, that you can move to when necessary to retouch the calibration grid if you, can, if you uh, feel that the U-frame uh, has uh, been uh, uh, compromised in some way. You can see now I, that uh, I've uh, touched up the orient origin point, the X direction point, moving to the Y direction point, and touching that up. And then uh, finally, the robot will move to the system origin point. One note here, some people uh, often ask me, how accurate does this have to be? And the, uh, the, there's no uh, quantifiable answer, but the answer I like to give is, as accurate as you very possibly can with the human eye. Don't take shortcuts. Don't uh, consider that close enough is good enough as close as you possibly can get with the human eye to the very center of that dot with a, a TCP, a pointer, that has been accurately taught in the same way. That's as accurate as you need to be. Um, you see we've uh, completed the process, not too long of a process, and now we have a taught user frame for that calibration grid. I'm going to show you how to do that calibration now that we have a taught calibration 
a grid. But first, I want to talk about the types of calibrations that are available in IR Vision. I find there's a lot of confusion about these. So let's start with the most basic calibration. That's called orthogonal calibration. Orthogonal calibration uh, calibrates a single plane. And that single plane must be at the height of the object that you're going to image. Orthogonal calibration does not consider height variation. That means it, can, it expects the scene to be geometrically, geometrically flat at the top of the features being located in your image. Variations in height will affect the accuracy of orthogonal calibration. And if you add, if you use uh, different processes uh, with a given orthogonal calibration, those processes all have to have the features at the same height as the original calibration. I have a quick question here that's come in on the Q&A, and the question is, how does tilt affect the generation of the user frame? Uh, by that question, I assume that you mean the tilt of the, uh, let, let me answer that in two ways. First of all, the tilt of the TCP doesn't really matter. A TCP, a tool center point is a tool center point in space, and it's only getting the X, Y, Z orientation. It doesn't take into account the pitch and yaw, so um, pitch, yaw, or rotation. So uh, touching up the uh, user frame on a given plane with a a TCP that has a slight tilt to it, it doesn't matter in terms of teaching the user frame. Now, let's talk about one other case. There are many times where you need to teach, there, there may be times where you need to teach a user frame that's not parallel to world space. And I'm not sure what this question, if that's what this question is about, but let me answer this part of, <laughs> let me answer it in the second way as well. If you have a calibration frame that's tilted at 45 degrees relative to the robot world space or 90 degrees or at some, uh, gen uh, some uh, uh, random angle relative to the, um, uh, the world space of the robot, that's okay. And you can certainly train that user frame in that, uh, in that angular orientation. One thing we'll note as we, and I'm going to talk about this as we move forward into the calibration, is that if you teach a calibration, a calibration frame at an angle, the IR vision camera ha at an angle relative to world space, the IR vision camera has to be at that angle still perpendicular to the calibration plate, and the, calibra uh, the IR vision uh, calibration must use uh, that uh, calibration um, grid user frame in order to see the, in order to accurately uh, provide the calibration to your uh, IR vision process. Let me, let me make sure I made that clear. The camera must be perpendicular to the user frame, or to the calibration grid frame, and if it's a tilted calibration grid frame, that grid frame uh, as a user frame must be used as the application frame in your process. That's the only time it does have to be used. I'll review that as we go into calibration itself. So that's orthogonal calibration. Let's talk about perspective calibration. Oh, first of all, I want to remind, mention one other thing about orthogonal after we had that question. Orthogonal calibration does not mean, let me, re, let me clarify something that I think is a confusing issue. Orthogonal calibration does not mean that the calibration does not correct for planar or perspective distortion. Just like we said earlier, all calibration corrects for planar and perspective types of calibration in the image and in the, uh, in the uh, 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 lens. Perspective calibration and IR vision means something entirely different. What perspective calibration does, it takes into account the lens configuration and un knows, as part of the calibration process, the lens focal length and the lens uh, angle of imaging. You can do this in a couple of ways, either by direct entering the lens focal length into a perspective calibration, or you can use a what's called a two-plane calibration, and the calibration uh, process will discover the lens focal length automatically. Here's the difference. Perspective calibration is required when you want to use multiple processes for that calibration where the part Z heights will vary. Here's why. Let's look at this uh, uh, graphic here. 
if I only calibrate to P1, plane 1, and then the part or the surface of the part is up on plane 2, the camera angle of imaging, as dictated by its focal length, will see this dot on P2, but where does that dot uh, uh, arrive on the calibration plane? It arrives here on calibration plane P1. That's an error because the part is no longer flat on the calibration grid or on the calibration plane. The part, the part that's being imaged is higher than the calibration plane and then is being influenced by the angle of attack of the image, the angle of attack of the ray of the image. Perspective calibration handles this for you automatically. If you calibrate to this height, the perspective or at this at this given height, the perspective calibration knows the image angle, knows the lens focal length, and later in a process, if you say my part is going to be this height above the original calibration uh, uh, plane, the process will correct for that and provide you with the correct offset. That's perspective calibration. It can be done either with a uh, multi-plane multi uh, robot-held uh, calibration grid with a fixed camera or a uh, robot-mounted camera and a static calibration grid. And there's one other way to do that, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Okay. Let's move on to calibrating a manually defined grid. We've already calibrated that grid. Uh, you saw that in the video. I'm not going to go through that process uh, step by step here on our live imaging but uh, and our live demo. But uh, imagine now that we have a correctly defined U-frame that represents that calibration grid that is flat on a surface that is the surface, the same surface that the top of our parts are going to be imaged. We uh, use the, uh, a calibration tool in IR Vision to calibrate the camera to that calibration grid. And the most important thing to remember in this process is that when you touch up that grid, the grid must not be moved from the touch up location, uh, otherwise the calibration will not be valid. So let's go right to our calibration tool setup demo. And I'm going to uh, introduce here a few uh, a few uh, new windows as we're looking at this. Oops. One moment. There we go. I hope you can all see on your uh, on your screens now. Up in the upper uh, left-hand corner, I have the IR Vision runtime display on my PC hooked up to our robot web browser. I have a live webcam display of our IR Vision uh, our uh, IR Vision uh, demo cell that we use here at Fanuc Corporate to do IR Vision evaluations, IR Vision training, IR Vision demos. And uh, let me just go through the features of this cell so you can understand kind of what you're looking at. We have a, uh, an LRM8 robot, an LRM8 200ID. On the end of arm, I have a 3DL uh, laser sensor. Uh, which we're not going to really discuss at, in, uh, at all in this demonstration, but I'm using the 2D camera that comes with that sensor as part of my demonstration. Over here, and it's a little bit hard to see in the imaging, but I have a fixed camera, and to the far, uh, to your far left, we have a 3D area sensor, which is a, uh, a 3D point cloud system that's used for uh, bin picking and other 3D applications. And you can see that we are live. I'll just say hello. Hi there. And we're going to use this cell to demonstrate uh, our uh, calibration, all of our calibration functions today. So let's get started with a, uh, a calibration of the fixed camera. Camera, using the grid here that we uh, using a grid very similar to the one that we just touched up. I'm going to go to my camera calibration tools in my IR Vision setup menu and select a tool that I've already set up, which is a grid pattern calibration tool. I call it Fixed Cal. First thing I want to do is turn on a light. There we go.
Um, goes without saying, uh, and this is not a discussion of lighting, but I like to include this in almost every discussion of IR vision, that it's, in, it's critically important for IR vision applications that you have the appropriate dedicated illumination source to correctly uh, light your field of view. So we have a variety of lights on our demo cart, and I'll just turn this one on to um, highlight our, our fixed grid under the, under the uh, fixed camera. Let's go through this process step by step and looking at the individual parameters. If we had multiple robots, we'd be able to select which robot is going to be offset by this calibration tool. Uh, for this tool, I'm going to use application, for this calibration, I'm going to suggest that I'm using application user frame zero. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if the calibration was not perpendicular to the robot world frame, we would have to use a correctly trained uh, user frame that was on the same angle as the, uh, as the application it was going to use for the, uh, uh, in, in your vision process. Uh, typically, it's easiest to use the calibration grid frame that has been touched up at an angle as the application frame in that case. That's the only case, and that and multiple robots are the only two cases where we need a specific application frame. In all other cases, world frame is good, or any frame that you want to work your work within your processes is fine. I've selected a camera that's been pre-configured called fixed camera. And of course, you may know that we can adjust our exposure in milliseconds to make the amount of time the camera uh, is open to receiving light reflected off the object uh, increase or decrease that amount of time. It's critical that we enter the correct grid spacing for the grid being used. And the grid spacing is the spacing between the individual dots uh, in all of the I, panic IR vision grids, uh, the grid spacing is listed at the lower corner, lower left, right corner of the grid, uh, and you can read it directly off the grid. And if you're making your own, you have to be accurate in specifying your grid spacing. I'm using an orthogonal calibration, and that limits us to a single plane. It, the, uh, in this case, of course, the, ro the grid is not robot held. And that's all we need to do to get a calibration for a fixed camera with a static calibration grid. First step is to set the fixture position, and then we find the, the dots on the grid. Now, you can see that I've already done this once, but let me show you that we would uh, move the uh, region of interest around the targeted dots. Uh, getting it as close as possible. It's not necessary to see all of the dots, but um, we want to uh, move our we want to move our region of interest so that we don't see uh, unimportant or uh, incorrect uh, data around the sides of the grid. I'll say I'll say okay. The system is going to calibrate and return the relationships between the dots and their real-world coordinates relative to how we taught that user frame when we touched it up. We'll go and look at our uh, calibration data. And the data that's provided, no, remember this is orthogonal, so we don't get the focal distance. We can see the lens distortion, however, the uh, resulting magnification. The vertical spacing of the CCD is as discovered by the calibration. The aspect ratio, almost one to one. Um, and then error of the individual pixels in the calibration uh, grid, a mean error and a maximum error. And we can even look at those individual points to see the relationships. At zero, zero in the, in the world, the vertical and horizontal pixels were uh, uh, listed as here. And then we have a variety of um, errors ranging from very low to about 1.5 pixel. Depending on your application, that may turn out to be and should turn out to be a very usable and very uh, viable app, uh, calibration. And so with that, we've successfully calibrated a fixed camera using a static grid. A quick question has come in, what would be the difference between when using different application frames? Let's say between the world frame and the calibration grid frame. Well, it, when the world, it's a good question, and again, a, a source of uh, confusion frequently. If the calibration frame, uh, or your, if your application frame, 
excuse me, if your application frame and subsequently your calibration frame frame are parallel to the robot world, that means that the frame, as you can see here, is with re within very close uh, approximation is flat relative to the robot world then it doesn't matter uh, what application frame you use. You would do it at your convenience uh, relative to your application. You know a lot of people use different frames throughout their uh, automation cell to make it easier to uh, uh, consolidate movement and so on. So uh, if the calibration is, uh, if the calibration and the application frame is flat to the world, then it, there's no difference between using the world frame and a gr cal, cal grid frame or the, the grid frame that you used when you set up the calibration grid. No difference, uh, other than the fact that the cal grid frame would be a limited, uh, a limited frame relative to the world. So it's convenience for you at that point. The only rule is that if the frame is tilted, if the grid frame is going to be tilted in some uh, arbitrary position that is not perpendicular to or parallel to the world frame, you must use a frame that's approximated or that's trained to that tilted frame. And the calibration frame and the application frame uh, must be at that same angle. Always with the, ca uh, the camera, of course, perpendicular to the calibration and application frame. Okay, hopefully that answered that question. So that's uh, our, fixed our fixed orthogonal calibration. And let's move on to a couple of automated processes. In doing so, I'm going to show you more about perspective calibration. But the important thing here as we move forward is that I'd like to introduce you, if you haven't seen these already, I think it's very important that I introduce you to these automated processes. Um, we have a couple. One is called automated, automatic grid frame set, and the other is robot generated grid calibration. Now, automatic grid frame set actually is not even an IR vision process. It sets a user frame from a calibration grid automatically. It doesn't perform the calibration, but it very, very accurately uses a camera to set a user frame. You could use this for any reason. Um, you could, uh, if you needed, for, for, for uh, any reason in your application, if you needed a very accurate user frame and wanted one that could be set and reset automatically, you can use automatic grid frame set. It's often used when we have multiple robots, for example. But it's a very simple to execute process, and for many cases, I find it's both more convenient and much more accurate to use this automated grid frame set in a calibration, uh, in a camera calibration process. And I'll show you how to do that now. So what is uh, the cal automated grid frame set for? It's for fixed or robot mounted cameras, as we see in the picture here. If, of course, if we uh, use a fixed mounted camera, the U-frame that will be returned is a tool frame. If we use a robot mounted camera, the frame being returned is a user frame. As I said, it's more accurate and automated, and it can be used in any situation, not just higher vision. And in fact, you can even use an external USB camera on the teach pendant uh, that's available from us here at FANUC uh, to do automated grid frame set if you're not doing it in conjunction with IR vision. What are the steps? First of all, we want to position the grid in a place where the camera can see it, uh, or in, in our case, we're going to use, a, as our example, we're going to use a robot mounted camera, and we're going to position the camera over the grid. Set the process parameters, I'll show you how to do that. Execute the automated grid frame process, and then if we're going to move on, that gives us the grid frame, if we're going to move on to calibration, just like before, we have to maintain the grid position without moving it after we have executed the grid frame process, and configure a calibration tool to execute a two-plane calibration. We can even automate that calibration process, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But let's look at the automated grid frame setting in a demonstration. I'll get our images up here again. And we have an echo here of our teach pendant. Let me get this uh, uh, vision setup off of the screen because we're not going to use vision setup. And I'll go to my teach pendant. And under 
IR vision, utilities, we find this menu. This has the robot generated grid calibration and number two, automated automatic grid frame setting. We'll look at the detail and I'll go over these parameters. Very quick to set this. Since it is a, a, a robot mounted camera, we're going to create a U frame. And as part of that setup, I can select which user frame number that the, uh, that the U-frame will be put into. I also, as a side uh, benefit from the uh, automated grid frame setting process, get a user tool that is related to the camera and is the center of the field of view of the camera. This could be very useful for a number of reasons. Uh, I, in fact, use it after automated grid frame set to uh, use a tool offset to move the camera around that frame. Uh, very convenient to use. We have to specify the camera that we're going to that we're going to use in the process. And uh, I've already set up a, a, a variety of cameras for this uh, demo cell. This is the robot mounted camera at a 1280 by 1024 resolution. We'll set the exposure time of that camera. And uh, to do that, we could display the image right on our teach pendant and go to live and double check that we've got a good, uh, ex a good exposure time for a, a correct image in this, uh, in this application. And we do have a good exposure time, five milliseconds. I tested that and it works pretty well. Um, you may need some trial and error to get to the correct setting, but um, by seeing that image in the on the teach pendant, you can see that you have a good uh, a good exposure. Grid spacing of this grid is 15 uh, millimeters, and the next thing I do have to do is record the start position for the camera over the grid over the grid that's going to be imaged. I've uh, already moved the camera. As you can see in the uh, uh, see in the live webcam, I've moved the camera uh, directly over the grid and used the crosshairs to center it on the grid. That's not a critical uh, issue that it has to be perfectly centered, but I'd like to do that as a st good starting point. And we press shift and record to record that start position. Let's look at the remaining parameters and uh, I want to make a special note about these parameters. We have, uh, during this process, in discovering the, uh, the, center, the tool center point and the user frame of this calibration grid, the robot's going to make a number of moves. Uh, and these moves will involve angular moves in yaw, pitch, and roll. It's uh, not a big issue if you have a big, big robot and with a long reach and the tooling is well away from the body of the robot and there are no uh, other uh, uh, obstructions. It's not too uh, big an issue uh, to simply use the default values, which are much higher than the values you see here. Of course, I'm using a small robot with some rather large tooling relative to the robot and I want to make sure that the motion of the robot doesn't result in doesn't result in the robot attempting to move uh, the tooling back and fold back on itself. Now of course this could be um, this could be compensated for uh, in uh, in uh, collision detection but uh, just to be safe I want to keep these numbers small for my smaller robot. And the robot also will move up and down in Z as part of this process. We want to limit that uh, just due to our uh, clearances on this cell. So with all of those parameters set, I'm going to clear my, uh, clear my other programs that may have been running and execute my automated grid frame set. You'll see at the bottom, the robot's going through a series of moves and both in the runtime screen up above and in our runtime screen on the teach pendant, you'll see the, um, the uh, image changing as we move, as the robot moves around. Each move, it, it takes another image and discovers where that uh, grid pattern is. It'll make rotate, as I mentioned, it'll do rotation, as you can see here. And in a moment, you will also see it do some yaw and pitch of the camera. Right there. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, that's just a straight move. There's a little bit of yaw. And so all of this is taking place in order to help it discover the, uh, in order to allow it to discover where the camera is and where the robot is relative to that calibration grid. It returns a very accurate user frame relative to the calibration grid with zero, zero at the center of the grid. As you're watching this, I want you to think about the process we went through in terms of training a tool center point and touching up manually a, a calibration grid and doing it in a way that was that resulted in, a, in an accurate and a very precise touch up. That could take us, and I, I, even a, an experienced user, it could take us uh, anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes, uh, and that's if you're an experienced user already. This may look like it's taking a little bit of time, but I find that at a 50% uh, uh, cycle rate, 50% 50, 50 rate, uh, this process takes only a couple of minutes. As we're looking at this, let me answer a quick question. For automated user frame generation process, do we need to have the camera U-tool frame generated and calibrated? No. Uh, there, we don't need anything in terms of a U-tool. We don't need anything in terms of a U-frame. The camera, uh, the process itself does all that for us automatically. I should note, as you can see in the runtime screen, the uh, camera is finding uh, the dots on the grid. If you have a smaller field of view, it's not necessary for the camera to find all the dots. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's sufficient, although not necessarily as accurate, but it is sufficient if the camera only finds the four large dots in the center of the calibration grid. And there we go, in a very quick amount of time, that grid frame has been set, frame number six has been updated, and we have a very, very accurate, a very accurate uh, calibration. But that's not the end of this process, and let me move forward now. I, I, I shouldn't say we have an accurate calibration, we have an accurate grid frame. The question is, what do we do with that grid frame next? We have a perfect grid frame. We, the next thing we have to do is actually execute a calibration. Uh, so let me uh, demonstrate that process. In our vision setup, we're going to go to a, a gr another grid ca pattern calibration tool. So the tool doesn't change. The only difference here is, is that we have a very accurate and automatically uh, executed user frame from a grid. So let's go through this tool, and the only thing I'm going to do different from my previous demonstration is I'm going to use a perspective calibration, a two-plane calibration. Remember, the um, the tool is, uh, or the, excuse me, the, the camera is on the end of arm, and as such, I can move that uh, camera up and down to gain two different planes to create a perspective calibration. How do we do that? Well, let's look at the parameters again. Of course, we only have one robot to work with. So I'm going to use application user frame zero because that's my uh, world, world and I'm perpendicular to the world or parallel to the world um, uh, frame. I have, this is the same camera that we use to execute the automated grid frame setting uh, at an exposure time of five milliseconds. We have, uh, we know uh, from our uh, grid frame process that this is a 15 millimeter grid. And this time I'm gonna select two planes for my calibration. That automatically makes this calibration a perspective calibration. It's not a robot held uh, calibration grid. Uh, the, camera configuration knows that the robot or the, the camera is robot held. And the grid frame that we just created uh, back in our uh, automated grid frame set is the user frame six. So that's the cal grid frame I'm going to use in this calibration. So let's show how we do a two plane calibration. I'm going to start at this at the uh, field of view that I currently have, which was the default uh, setting of that 
the camera position for the automated grid frame set. And I'll set that position. If you were starting from scratch, of course, these would not be set. Uh, these would say not set instead of found and set. Not found and not set. So the first plane is already in the field of view, and the camera is already at the correct position. I'm going to say find. Move my uh, region of interest as appropriate around the uh, calibration grid and say OK. And the calibration grid uh, at that plane now has been discovered and, cal and calibration data calculated. The next thing we want to do is move the camera up about 100 millimeters. 100 millimeters is a good minimum to use when you're setting a two-plane calibration. So I'll do that just by jogging in world. And I'll simply uh, jog up uh, and to kind of estimate the uh, Estimate it as 100 millimeters. So let's go to that distance. I'll snap a picture and set the second plane. Note that because IR Vision is tightly linked and on the same controller as the robot, IR Vision knows how far the robot's moved to do this second plane calculation. Moving our region of interest precisely, or at least uh, roughly around the uh, dots, and it's going to find those dots as well and calculate a two-plane perspective calibration. Let's look at the data. The difference in this data is now we have an actual calculated focal length uh, op calculated from the actual optics of the lens, uh, and it's found that it's 16.520. People ask me, well, does this, uh, is this supposed to be the exact focal length listed on the lens? The answer is no, lenses, come in, lenses are uh, generally specified, and the uh, actual focal length optically can change due to a number of reasons, most importantly, uh, the focus ring on the lens. So th it won't be an exact, uh, an exact uh, match to the camera, but it'll be pretty close. Very low lens distortion has been discovered at a magnification of 0.195 millimeters per pixel. That's the size of an individual pixel in this field of view. Uh, it shows us the other information. And then mean error and maximum error, we have an extremely good calibration out of this automated grid, cal se uh, grid frame setting and the perspective calibration. A couple of things that, uh, that are returned that are, can be of very good use to you later if you want to set up your own frames, your own tools, or even points to move to. Uh, it returns the position of the camera relative to the calibration grid, the position of the calibration grid relative to world, uh, which was my application U-frame, and the position of the robot holding the camera. Pretty interesting data that comes out of that. And of course, as before, we can look at the points that have been returned and see what the relationship between the world points and the uh, camera points was. Always want to save that, and now we have a very usable and a very accurate uh, calibration of our robot-mounted camera. Let me point out, though, it doesn't end there. Um, I mentioned that this process can be automated. Now that we have the, now we have the accurate uh, grid frame, and I'm going to assume that you're going to set up your grid frame so that they can be repositioned in front of the camera when necessary. Now that we have that uh, accurate grid frame, we can automate the calibration process so that at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't have to have your tech, uh, you or your technician doesn't have to go to a robot and recalibrate the robot from uh, IR Vision setup just because the camera moved. We can put that into a teach pendant program and, uh, and uh, automate that process. So let's find the. Uh, I want to look at the uh, name of that program. <laughs> there we go. It was right up front here. OK, let's go through this program quickly. It's very easy to do. I'm going to set my user frame to the application.
patient frame and my U tool to world. And I've already trained a point at which that's the uh, starting point for that camera uh, for the first frame. I'll call uh, a, a routine, a Carol routine called IRB backlash that uh, does a small movement to load up the servos to correct for any servo positioning error uh, as the camera's moved on that joint move, and then call a, routine, a IR vision routine called camera calib. The camera calib routine calls my the uh, calibration routine I've already created called RobeCam Cal One that we were just working with in our vision setup. And we give it a request of one. That means that tells the routine to take a picture and calibrate the first image, uh, the first plane. We then move to a second point, and I've offset that point by a Z of minus 100. Call backlash again, and then run the uh, vision camera calib on the calibration routine, but with a request of two that tells the routine to take a picture and calibrate the second plane. So you can imagine how easy this will be. I'll watch, watch, this, uh, watch this process. I'm going to run this uh, calibration at a kind of a slow rate. You can watch in the live image and also watch the runtime image. And you can see the robot's going to move, take a picture, move, take a picture, and now we have done that calibration without ever entering IR vision setup. We've automated the calibration process, and it actually becomes a very accurate process because of that IRV backlash. We now, because that uh, even helps to correct even further the position of the camera in space. So there we have automated grid cal, or automated grid frame setting using an IR vision calibration frame and tying it in to an automated process that completely automates your calibration in a very uh, accurate way. It can be used with a fixed camera or a robot-mounted camera. We're almost ready to wrap up here, and the th last thing I want to leave you with is robot-generated grid calibration. Now, robot-generated grid calibration is a semi-automated process. I would like to, I would prefer to call it mostly an automated process <laughs> uh, to perform accurate calibration using the robot to manipulate a target. Um, it's a great, uh, you're going to see that it's a great time saver and a much more accurate way to calibrate a camera, only, however, when the camera is fixed and when the robot can be made to reach in front of the camera uh, in a, in a sufficient, with sufficient motion to move uh, in space, to move a target in space. Uh, the, ca the documentation says it's very beneficial when large field of views are used. I want, fields of view are used. I want to give you a hint. You can use this in all cases when space permits. You can see the limitations of the space I have on this demo cell, and in any case, I'm going to be able to perform a uh, robot-generated grid calibration. What are the gotchas when you do that? The main there are two main gotchas. The first main gotcha is, of course, you're going to uh, uh, collide with something, and you have to take special care to make sure you're, uh, you have uh, collision avoidance, DCS, or whatever set to avoid uh, the uh, avoid collision during this process. You'll see what I mean when I start it out. The second thing is, depending on the robot, depending on where your target is held on the robot. I find that we can get into singularities as the system moves around. And that really is more trial and error. Uh, to avoid that, you're going to have to try the robot-generated grid, grid calibration process and then um, maybe just change how the robot is presenting that target to the camera to avoid uh, singularities. As I said, it's only for fixed mount camera applications. And again, it, it creates an automated TP program, just like we just did with the uh, automated grid frame set, uh, that can be easily reused without operator training of uh, using IR vision setup. What are the execution steps? Set an application frame, mount the target, configure the camera. I'll show you how the, all these steps as we go through the demo. Configure the vision calibration process. Execute the measuring process, generate the calibration program, which we'll take a look at as a TP program, and then execute that TB TP program. So here we go with robot-generated grid calibration. Once again, 
We go to our teach pendant and robot generated grid calibration is executed from Vision Utilities. And we see three uh, steps here. We need the calibration data, the target position, and uh, we're going to re execute the target position, then we're going to program uh, or generate the program. The first step then is to get the target, which is on the end of my tooling, in front of the camera. I have a, a, a quick program that will make it easy to do that. And it kind of shows you that even with a uh, even with a small robot and small working space, we can get that robot in front of the camera in a way that um, that allows us to move the target in front of this fixed camera. Let's turn that light off. So now we have our uh, our camera our, our target in front of the camera. You're going to see in a minute what that target looks like because the next step is to prepare a calibration, and this is a different calibration that we've used before. It's a calibration found in an iRevision setup, and it's called Robot Generated Grid Cal Tool. Let's go through the parameters of this tool, and here you can see the target in front of the camera. Once again, application frame is defined, and we can just the, the same rules apply. We can use world or a predefined application frame. I'm going to use the fixed camera that we've had, uh, that we've been using for this application. Set our exposure time to a, an appropriate exposure that gets a good image for the target being, uh, being imaged. Uh, and uh, set our plane spacing, as we did in the other routine, to an appropriate number, usually a minimum of about 100 millimeters. The other thing we want to do in this, in this initial setup is to record, is to tell IR vision where that robot's going to be to start out, and we're going to record that position by just pressing the record button. It goes out, finds those uh, joint uh, positions, and stores them in our vision process. We have one one other step that's cru crucial to robot generated grid calibration, and that is because this is not a known target, we have to train the target. Now, this, how about a just quick word about the target? The target does doesn't have to be any specific target. It can be anything that you can see with the GPM locator tool. There's one caveat. The target must have uh, angular non-symmetry so that the GPM can detect angular rotation of that target. So it can't be a circle. Uh, it has to be something that has uh, angular uh, non-symmetry in an angular locate. And my target has a, a is a, a reasonable target for this process. I'm going to retrain that target here, or if it were your first time in, you would just train the target. And uh, let's uh, edit those. Let's edit that mask uh, like we do with many uh, GPM operations. You can see my target is not uh, a very fancy target. It's actually just a couple of calibration circles with a cross drawn between them. But that's very good for a target, and that's going to work out just fine. The next thing we want to do uh, that may be different from other, uh, even your IR vision processes, is we want to set the degrees of freedom and the parameters to be as forgiving as possible because this is going to make a lot of moves just like our previous process. So I'm going to set my um, uh, some of my parameters a little bit more forgiving. And then also, very importantly, I'm going to set my... Uh, degrees of freedom to allow for a lot of rotation and a lot of scaling and aspect because the robot's going to move this around very similar to the moves we saw in the other automated process. So let's make it uh, quite forgiving. And uh, make sure that it finds that. Very good. Save that, and now we've done. We're, we've completed configuration of the IR Vision tool for robot generated grid cal. The rest of the process happens on our teach pendant. Once again, we'll go to IR Vision utilities, and we're already at robot generated grid cal. First thing I have to do is uh, select the uh, uh, calibration. Uh, the IR Vision calibration routine that uh, I've just created, and that's called Robot Gen Cal. And 
when it says target position, what it's saying here, or that what it's saying here is this is a process that has to be run. Now it has, a, I've already recorded one, but I'm gonna rerun that process and you're gonna see how this uh, functions. So keep an eye on the uh, live window and on the runtime window as I run, oops, excuse me. <laughs> Keep an eye on those windows as I run, I pressed the wrong button, as I run the uh, uh, target position discovery. Oops. There we go. You can see the robot making a lot of moves. And also uh, take note that it is limiting its moves to the search window that was defined when I defined the GPM tool. This could be important to your application, again, to keep the robot from possibly crashing or moving out of an area that you want it to be in. Um, all of these moves are necessary in order for it to discover this object this target object as a tool center point. So it's measuring the target position of this object as a tool center point. This could be a real side benefit to some of you. You don't need to um, use this process to complete the calibration. You could use this process just to discover a tool center point using uh, the IR Vision camera. Um, as you see the robot move, you'll notice the reason for me limiting some of the yaw pitch and roll uh, in the automated grid cal, but in the robot generated grid cal, that yaw pitch and roll is not, um, it's not possible to limit those movements. So you have to be careful. And uh, I guess the first time you run that, we'd want to make sure that you run that pretty slowly. Okay, it's already discovered the target position. Let's move on to generating the program. The program generation is, uh, the purpose of the program generation is now that it knows the target position, it's going to move around the field of view and create the dots, the virtual dots of our virtual calibration grid. You'll see what I mean as you watch this happen. Here we go. If you're watching carefully, it may be difficult to see, but uh, the robot is using the IRV backlash to uh, load up the the, um, the uh, uh, servos as it uh, moves to these different points to get the most accurate point possible for the uh, target as it moves it around the field of view. So it's going to discover where that target resides in the field of view at this uh, plane. Take several steps. You see how it moves it out. And now it's going to go to a higher plane and, and once again discover where that target lives in the uh, plus 100 millimeter plane. As you're watching this, I know 30 or 40 seconds can be boring in real time, but keep in mind the difference between doing this process and our manual touch up process. Again, I've never been able to really do a good manual, a good manual grid frame touch up and tool center point train in less than 10, 15, 20 minutes. This is going to take, even though it seems long as you're watching it, it's really only going to take in total about 90 seconds to a couple of minutes. Although we may uh, occasionally have a uh, we may occasionally have a small problem in our our uh, GPM, just like we had there, and it's, I guess that's a good thing for you to see that we've uh, we've had a small error in the GPM. I'm going to make sure that it can find uh, can find this at the. Uh, at the uh, values uh, we've set, and it's simply a scaling problem. 
It's the common thing to happen in this process. It's not a problem. We'll just reset that, save it, and just re quickly re rerun our program generation. Let's start again. We can resume or restart, and I'm going to go ahead and resume because we were quite a ways into that process. So it just resumes from that step, uh, making a, a rerun of the process pretty quick and easy, as you can see. So where we're at now with this the robot generated grid calibration is we've done the work in our utility to set up the process. And now it's, uh, it's completed its location of a tool center point and discovery of the grid pattern. And it's communicated that grid pattern to a TP program, and here we go with the TP program. You can see that there are a, 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 a long series of points. Each of these points represent a single dot on a virtual grid. We can run this program now, and that's what executes the calibration. We don't need to do anything further in the IR Vision uh, calibration tool. It's all handled automatically from the uh, Teach Pendant program that's been created. Again, think about this benefit. You're not going to have to come in at the, in the middle of the night or from another uh, location and run IR Vision setup or IR Vision calibration to recalibrate this camera should it get moved or uh, a fork truck hit your cell or something like that. It's a simple process. You could even have an operator or a technician run this program to get it to recalibrate the camera automatically. I'm sorry. Except that I have to um, select the correct program. Thank you. There we go. So now if you watch the live uh, robot and the uh, runtime screen, you're going to see that the uh, robot is simply moving to a series of points at two planes. And at each point, it's going to record the point uh, of the robot in real world coordinates and record the vision, uh, the point uh, as, as discovered by vision, by the vision calibration routine. Uh, for the center of that target. And this creates, if you can imagine it, and you'll see here in a moment, creates a virtual grid of dots. And there we have our virtual grid of dots. Let's just prove that that's what we've accomplished by looking at our uh, uh, IR Vision tool. And we can see that it's produced a very, uh, very viable uh, two-plane calibration, discovering the camera, uh, the camera focal distance, 